So uh, welcome uh, this afternoon to the SEG Europe Regional Advisory Committee's webinar series, State of the Energy Industry in Europe. Today, the chair of the Regional Advisory Committee, Dr. Adriana Ramirez, and I will serve as your host for the first presentation in this series by Tim Dodson, entitled The Future of Europe's Prolific Basins. Tim Dodson is a citizen of the United Kingdom and has 38 years of industry experience, where nearly 33 of those years were with uh, Statoil. He has a Bachelor's of Science in Geology from the University of Kiel in the UK. Tim started his career in the oil and gas industry in 1980 with an oil and gas service company and worked for five years in South America and the Middle East. Tim joined Statoil's Exploration and Production Norway unit in 1985, where he has held various management positions within exploration, production, and technology, as well as HR. From 2004 to 2008, he held a position as Senior Vice President for Exploration in Norway, and in 2008, he was appointed as Senior Vice President for Global Exploration in Statoil's business area for international operations. As of 1 January 2011, Tim has led the exploration business area in Statoil as Executive Vice President and is a member of the Corporation uh, Corporate Executive Committee. And with that, I would like to welcome Tim to present to us today uh, his presentation, The Future of Europe's Prolific Basins. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I guess it's probably a good evening, good afternoon, and good morning, uh, depending where you are um, around the world. Um, uh, thank, you for the, uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, hopefully you can, uh, can, can see the slides. At least my opening comment would be that I really like this, the, the first slide, which um, I'm showing here. Um, it's the um, Trollay platform uh, offshore Norway. It's one of three on the troll oil and gas field, um, and it's still the um, the tallest structure ever ever moved by by mankind. mankind. It's um, concrete gravity based uh, structure weighing six hundred and fifty thousand tons, and the total height of four hundred and seventy meters. Troll was discovered in nineteen seventy nine and is expected to produce for a total of, 20 year, of 70 years and represents 40% of the total gas reserves on the Norwegian shelf when we have a lot of gas. Uh, in 2018, um, we'll sanction the third phase of development almost 40 years after, after the, the initial discovery. But what I really like about this picture is actually the drilling rig in the foreground. And this is uh, kind of very typical for, for what we're seeing in Norway, i.e. we uh, continue to explore in the same areas as we started exploring uh, offshore, offshore Norway uh, some 50 years ago. And we're still making oil and gas discoveries more than, more than 40 or 50 years after, after those first wells. So as the head of exploration in Statoil, my job is to continue to hunt for oil and gas in Norway, but also to look for new areas around the world which could have the same potential. I'm not going to focus too much on those to, 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 to today. I would like to sort of step back and up a little bit and share a little bit of corporate uh, context. So hopefully you see the second slide here, it's entitled Delivering on Our Strategy. Um, last year, um, uh, the executive committee has sort of, um, uh, presented a, 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 a revised uh, corporate strategy, if you like, and it's basically built around uh, three uh, three main principles always safe high value and uh, low carbon uh, as you can see from the left hand chart you know, sort of our, our safety record has improved um, but still not uh, is not where we would like it to be uh, in exploration we've made important contributions over the last two years my unit has responsibility for all geophysical operations in statal both exploration development and production both when it comes to acquisition and uh, and uh, and processing, and over the last two years, we've been fortunate enough, or at least good enough, not to have any serious incidents either within our seismic or geophysical operations or otherwise in exploration. So our serious in in incident frequency has in fact been zero. So it, uh, it it just tells you it is possible. If I move to sort of the second principle, which is about high value, and I'll come back to sort of what I call a high quality resource afterwards, but the um, NCS and the UK, which are really the two major prolific basins in Europe, which I'll focus on today, they still offer Statoil and others high value opportunities. Uh, we remain the largest producer in the North Sea ba Basin, even after the Total Mashik deal was uh, completed. And then when it comes to low carbon, 
um, we actually feel this matters. And this is not just about renewables, it's very much about oil and gas portfolio. We were amongst the first of the majors to revise our strategy you know, sort of as we transition to a, a cleaner, uh, cleaner uh, energy future. Um, we established a new energy, uh, uh, new energy business, uh, business area and at the same time we set a very ambitious target of uh, eight kilograms per barrel of oil equivalent uh, sort of per produced. We already have a very competitive uh, portfolio from a CO2 emissions point, point of view. Uh, but uh, as I say, we again sort of set a very um, uh, ambitious target into, into further reductions and truly believe that this matters and that it also matters to our most important stakeholders, including you know, the investment community. And we're starting to get you know, sort of confirmation of that feedback now. Um, high valuable, highly valuable and low carbon intensity exploration targets are, of course, becoming increasingly difficult to, to, to come by. So the next slide is uh, on the left hand side, it's all about volumes. On the right hand side, it's really about the investment. Um, what we can see from the, from the upper left hand chart, you know, sort of that, uh, uh, you know, sort of diminishing, diminishing returns in terms of uh, volumes discovered, either, you know, be it oil, uh, oil or gas in particular, oil, you know, over the last, uh, last 40, 40 years or so. And uh, even though there will be some adjustments, you know, 2017 is likely to go into the record book as the year in which, you know, um, the fewest barrels of oil equivalents were, were discovered the last 50 or 60 years. Around about 7 billion barrels, and I think these numbers according to, I think this might be IHS, but you can go to Woodmac, and I think it's actually Woodmac numbers, but, you know, they give the same, same indications. And what you can see depicted on this top left-hand chart in the black curve going up is the, uh, is the amount of oil and gas produced. And that the in industry resource replacement rate last year was around about 20% or maybe even a little bit less than that. What we can see on the right-hand side is that exploration spend is decreasing. And if you do the numbers on the bottom right-hand chart, you can see basically over there, if you take this peer group, that the expenditure has been halved. Uh, since uh, since 2015 and probably even more that if we go back to 2014 and 13. Uh, over the last, over this period here, the, the peer group, which is listed here, is basically the super majors, um, have discovered approximately 34 billion barrels of oil uh, the last six years. And we've contributed uh, it's close to 5 billion barrels of that. As I already said, you know, sort of the, the investment level, uh, has dropped off considerably and that obviously has a, quite an effect on the seismic budgets although when it comes to stato we've invest, rel invested relatively more than most others uh, through this uh, through the downturn one could of course question whether the lack of seismic acquisition is resulting in reduced opportunities for that space another curious fact you know but you probably know it from yourselves that if you look back until 1992 or go to pre-1992, the average success rate within the exploration industry was around about 20%. 1992, something happened, something very important happened. Of course, it was the birth, really, of, of 3D seismic. And since then, the success rate has consistently been around about 35%. Or well, there are some indications over the last year or two that that success rate may be, may be dropping off. In terms of overall spend, stat will spend about last year about 2% of uh, what was invested in exploration uh, uh, globally. Uh, or we discovered around about 2% of the volumes and we spent about 3% of the, uh, the amount spent in the industry. So based on, on, on this and, uh, and, and, and other aspects, I decided to uh, sharpen our exploration strategy uh, last year. So our ambition or my ambition is for us to be a leading explorer. We've had uh, a few meager years now, but in the years from 2011 through, through 13 into 14, yeah, we were right up there in terms of global exploration, uh, exploration success. But what does a leading explorer mean? You know, for me, it means you know, sort of delivering profitable, high quality resources. High quality meaning light hydrocarbons in good reservoirs with uh, big column heights. Um, and that is really sort of, um, you know, leading me to, to the, the three areas, you know, sort of a focus, a high level focus for ourselves. The one is about exploiting prolific basins, 
like in Norway, uh, which I've already talked about. And as I often say, I think a good place to, to, to look for, for more oil and gas is in areas where you found an awful lot before. And indeed, if you look at the industry uh, uh, at large and look back the last 20 years, you will see that almost 90% of all the new oil and gas which has been found has been found in basins that were already prolific in 1996. Uh, the second, uh, the second uh, prong of our, of our exploration strategy is about testing impact opportunities. And of course, in my job in Statoil is to keep Statoil exposed to what, we, what I like to call the transformational upside. We need to keep looking for areas and opportunities around the world which can be the next big thing. Things like the pre-salt in, uh, in, in Brazil. You know, we have other similar positions we can mention, you know, Porcupine Basin offshore West Island, you know, still frontier, or like when we tested the Corpfield prospect in the southeast Barents, you know, all the way uh, up in the northeast of the, uh, the Barents sector in the in Norwegian Sea. The third, uh, the third prong to the strategy is about access at scale. When we look to enter into new areas, we look to do that in a way that gives uh, plenty of follow-up potential, you know, sort of Often enough, you know, one discovery in itself is not really sufficient for us. We're a company that produces uh, 2 million barrel plus per day of oil equivalents. That means that we need to replace approximately 750 million barrels of oil equivalents every year just to stand still or to maintain that production. So uh, another uh, basin where, you know, so there's early days, um, but where we are, are, are looking to, uh, uh, where we've accessed at scale, is the onshore Thrace Basin in northwest uh, Turkey, where we are pursuing an unconventional play, uh, actually a basin-centered gas play. Another scale is about the, the amount of access we look to make uh, in any, any year. And exploration, as most of you probably recognize, is all about replenishment. Um, you know, this year, Statoil will drill uh, around about 40, uh, 40 wells. Of those, about 35, uh, 35 wildcats, and uh, and again, you know, sort of every time we drill the wildcat well, uh, that is a prospect tested, and out of our exploration portfolio, either because it's dry or because it's a commercial success, and we hand it over to our development and production colleagues. So every year, you know, so we drill 30, 35 wells. We need to come up with at least. 30 to 35 new candidates for the next year and the next year and the next year. So it's really about you know, sort of reinventing ourselves, replenishing you know, sort of that portfolio all the time. So in 2018, I said, yeah, we plan to drill about 40 wells. About 30 of those will be in uh, Norway and the UK, uh, three in the UK and the rest in, uh, in Norway. Um, we currently have uh, operations ongoing in, uh, in Brazil. Uh, both in the uh, Santos Basin, the BMS uh, 8 license, where we, where we have the, uh, the, the Karkala field, uh, and also further north in the Esperito Santo Basin. Uh, we will continue to test onshore opportunities, both in Turkey, Argentina, and Russia. And uh, we will um, be spudding our first onshore well in the uh, Vacamata in, um, in Argentina uh, this, uh, this week, in fact. So uh, um, it's all about, it's really all about commercial, uh, uh, the onshore and the unconventional opportunity set is all about commerciality and ability to identify locations within the acreage which give the best flow rates. So with most of the activity in Norway and the UK, I can give a bit more detail on the targets which we'll be testing. So these are, apologize for the uh, busy slide here, but uh, these, are, these are the wells which we plan to drill this year. Um, we drilled about 25 to, or 25 to 30 wells, I can't remember exactly the precise number in 2017. Um, um, uh, no, we, I say we drilled 25 to 30 wells in 2018, and that's uh, about 10 more wells than we drilled in 2017. Um, 12 to 14 of those wells will be in the North Sea, 8 to 10 in the Norwegian Sea, and then somewhere between 3 and 7, depending on where we get started in the... Uh, in the Barents Sea, and this underscores our commitment to this um, mature basins or basins, if you like, and our strategy to realise the full potential of this prolific basin. It's a balanced portfolio between ILX uh, growth and frontier wells, uh, less volumes with less risk, and higher volumes, obviously, with higher risk. 
uh, there are candidates in this world program that have the potential to be uh, to, to 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 be new standalone developments, um, but most of those um, have high geological uncertainty. The Barents Sea World Program is um, uh, this year is actually independent of the not very successful program we had in 2017. We will also drill important appraisal wells. Um, on a couple of the play opening wells so last year, uh, Cape Vulture in the uh, in the Norwegian Sea and uh, Verbier in the uh, in the UK. And then, of course, there will be many um, high value or highly profitable um, uh, ILX wells, around fifteen of those. Um, and then there will be um, a couple of uh, of um, HBAT uh, opportunities in the Norwegian Sea. Uh, sort of uh, where we're chasing uh, more gas condensate uh, resources rather rather than oil. Now, as I already mentioned, two exploration wells again this year on the UK on the UK shelf, and then one appraisal well. So that was a rather quick fire presentation. But in the interest of time, you know, sort of, I would rather you know, spend the time on the on the on on the QA, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have to what I've presented, or indeed. Uh, anything else related to uh, exploration on uh, on on a global basis? So I think uh, I'll uh, I'll leave it there for the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Um, for the question and answer session, uh, I would like uh, if uh, you have a question to uh, raise your hand, and I will move you into a position where you can actually speak. Um, where you currently are now, uh, you are unable to uh, be heard. Uh, to enhance the fidelity of the presentation. Um, in order to uh, raise your hand, if you find your name, and um, you can, um, should be a button where you can actually click and raise your hand. All right. I see someone has their hand raised. And I'm going to promote you to panelist. And Peter, you should be able to, uh, I'm going to unmute you, and you can ask your question. Okay, uh, thank you, Tim, for that presentation. Very interesting. Um, so I'm sitting in Aberdeen uh, on the west side of your map. Um, I was wondering about seismic plans for this year um, and a wider question. Um, your reaction to the Schlumberger decision to uh, exit the seismic acquisition market? Okay, should I go ahead and answer now? I guess I should, okay. Um, so when it comes to, uh, to our seismic plans, um, as I said, that we have, um, we have um, consciously uh, invested or punched above our weight when it comes to seismic investments uh, since the oil price uh, started to, uh, to, to, to drop off in I guess it was in, in, in 2014. Um, during that period, we have typically spent around about $200 million a year on, uh, on seismic. Um, and it's, um, as I'm sure you all well know, you know, it's been a really difficult time for, for the seismic industry. Uh, and so for us, you know, we've been able to make good use of that investment and being able to acquire um, by purchase um, more seismic for those $200 million than we typically did for a much bigger amount uh, a few years before. This year, uh, we made a conscious decision um, to reduce our seismic spend somewhat um, and prioritize to spend more money on wells uh, and, and that is because our overall exploration spend has come down quite significantly and we were getting to the stage a couple of years back at least where we were spending um, too little money on wells. Um, we were both opportunity constrained to a certain extent but also budget constrained and so where I am right now is that I wanted to adjust that somewhat. Um, uh, so that we um, have the ability to to drill more wells and to prove up more 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 volumes, if you like. 
Um, so that's where we are. Um, that's where we are right now. Um, so that, um, so that I, I think you know, we have a pretty tough internal seismic prioritization process. Uh, most years, um, the organization at large is asking for maybe three or four times as much money as we actually have uh, available. But as I say, I think we've built up a pretty good uh, database, global database of seismic the last few years, uh, allowing us to identify a number of new opportunities and drill more wells than we have for that. And I guess the major factor or really sort of decisive factor between increase be, be, for us to increase our size and expend again is that we have enough drilling success in 2000, 2018. Then a reaction to the, the, the Schlumberger, you know, sort of, I usually want to refrain from commenting on the, on the individual companies and uh, have to respect, respect the, the decisions which each of those companies, um, companies make. Uh, but of course, it, uh, it does give some cause for concern. Um, you know, following on from the other consolidation within within the industry, that uh, there are very few companies out there now. You know, sort of um, 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 with the uh, the willingness and the ability to to acquire you know, proprietary proprietary seismic. So that is a concern for us, and it has been a concern for us through the downturn here. Is you know sort of the uh, the, the survival of the seismic uh, seismic industry and sort of the sustainability going forward. So um, I think I'll leave it there. Okay, thank you. All right. All right. If anybody else has a question, all right. Let's see if someone has their hand up. Anthony. All right, Anthony, I'm going to uh, move you into a position where you can uh, speak. All right. Oh, you're muted. Hang on. There you go. Thank you very much for an interesting presentation. Uh, I think it's a very nice overview of a rather ambitious program. Um, you've talked a bit about the seismic spend that you have planned for this year. Could I flip the coin perhaps and ask also uh, what um, what your intentions are and what your past experience has been with non-seismic data. Um, as most people know, Stato was a leader and a pioneer in controlled source electromagnetics. And my specific question is, uh, how much of a percentage either this year or previously uh, has it uh, uh, made for a driver or an element in, uh, in, uh, in the prospects that you plan to drill or have drilled? Okay, um, great question. Um, as you say, uh, we have been, um, in, in many ways, been at the, been at the forefront yes, of um, of the development of, of other other sort of geophysical techniques, if you like, you know, sort of um, especially this electromagnets. And we have we have quite a lot of experience. And I think, uh, to be quite honest, you know, sort of uh, our engagement has gone a little bit in waves. Uh, and hopefully, you know, sort of, we've had a continual learning process around that. Um, I, th I think, you know, sort of, at a very high level, at a very high level, uh, my conclusion would, ha would, would have to be that we can never do without seismic. You know, sort of, uh, and in almost all cases, never do without 3D seismic. Uh, now I'm talking about exploration purposes. You know, sort of, some occasionally, we debate, you know, whether whether we uh, we should move forward, um, i.e., to, to to drilling uh, based on 2D only. Uh, but on almost every occasion, you know, um, we conclude that it would be better to have the 3D, uh, and that is not just from a point of getting the drilling location exactly right. It's also got something to do with the with the with the safety aspect, if you like. Um, when it comes to how much we spend on non-seismic data, I think that's varied somewhat. It is probably varied from a very low percentage to a low percentage when it comes to non-seismic data. Um, we've had some campaigns when it comes to electromagnetic data 
Um, and I would say that um, we've had moderate success uh, with the um, electro, uh, electromagnetic data. Uh, and it's a little bit, some, little bit like some of, the, um, some of the attribute analysis we do on the 3D seismic. You know, sort of the, we, we, we get to the stage where we think we know the answer and then we actually don't know the answer after, after all. Uh, the latest campaign yes, we had when it came to electromagnetic data was, uh, was in the Flemish Pass, uh, offshore Newfoundland. And, uh, and as I say, I think uh, we, put, we chose to put um, quite considerable weight on the results and we got some rather surprising and disappointing results from, uh, from, from the wells. So right now, um, I'm not aware of any plans to acquire um, I would say non-seismic data, and by that I'm not including obviously drilling data or well data. Um, nor, nor uh, and, and, and also including in that, you know, sort of uh, non-seismic data over and above, you know, sort of electromagnetic data. Um, so that's that's kind of that's kind of kind of where we are. May, maybe I take the opportunity to to, to just employ, you know, sort of expand a little bit. Uh, just on this question and the one that Peter asked before, and 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 it's really related to the quality of the seismic databases, especially the three D databases, you know, sort of uh, across the across the globe. And the map the map in front of us is probably sort of a, a really good example, if you like, where we've seen that even in Norway, which has been most of the shelf has been covered for many years with different lineages of three D data. We've seen that a lot of the new opportunities we've been generated the last few years have come on the back of extensive you know, broadband, uh, broadband acquisitions. And when we look across to the UK and we started to work the UK and Norway together from a regional point of view about four years back, we still see, still see you know, big holes in the 3D data coverage on the UK shelf. And we, uh, we think you know, there is um, a big opportunity there still yes still in the UK uh, and not least you know if we um, if we can put together a program maybe an industry program because it's very difficult for to us to fund that by itself uh, for example yes that we continue with our broadband acquisition not just in the Norwegian sector but across into the British sector of the uh, North Sea in particular yeah, thank you very much I'm going to move you back now. All right. Uh, we had a question that was uh, typed in, um, and uh, it's from Aziz. Uh, he uh, is on our committee. And the question is, because, uh, I guess it's not a question. Hang on. Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> um, he says, firstly, thanks for your presentation. Uh, my question is about uh, your Turkey uh, activities. Will Statoil apply the exploration licenses? Uh, and second, what is the cutoff gas production, these kind of onshore unconventional basins, um, or the minimum production rate for entering the market? Hmm. So could you, could you just repeat the first part of the question? Um, Yes, um, it's regards to the Turkey activities of Stat Oil. Mm -hmm. Will Stat yeah. Oil apply the exploration licenses? Um, and uh, I guess second, what is the cutoff gas production uh, of these kind of onshore unconventional basins? I'm mm -hmm. not exactly sure what is meant. Okay, uh, okay, let me. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what the first question is referring to, but um, just let me describe the position which we have in uh, which we have in Turkey. Um, we are involved in uh, two licenses uh, as a partner. Um, those licenses uh, are covering about two thirds of the entire Thrace Basin in the uh, north northwest. Um, Northwestern part of Turkey, so basically west of uh, west of Istanbul, um, we have a fifty percent uh, equity share in both those licenses. 
Uh, in both cases, they are be being operated by a small Canadian company, Valera. Um, they were the company to pick up this uh, acreage originally, and we farmed into both these licenses in 2016. Yeah. Um, so last year, we um, we drilled. It was basically a test of the basin centered gas concept. Uh, I guess we kept that pretty quiet um, uh, up until fairly recently. Uh, and it is a pretty special kind of concept um, where gas is neither trapped stratigraphically or stru structurally, um, but to do um, with um, uh, particular um, hydrocarbon phases, if you, if you like. Uh, so that you can actually uh, you can actually capture hydrocarbons you know sort of in the in the center of basin you know sort of um, with a a kind of a a a, a mechanical um, a mechanical closure if you if, if you like so Valera have been um, particularly communicative communicative about this uh, this uh, this um, this opportunity uh, we proved up more than a thousand meters of uh, of gas column uh, in the first well, and we conducted a number of uh, production tests. The results of those have also been published um, or announced, if you like, by 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 Valera. So that really leads me to the uh, the next question, which is the minimum production rate. Now, it's almost like asking, you know, what a long how long is a piece of string. Um, but um, in, in, in this case, and I'm trying to remember the units, um, but basically, do you remember the units? No. So basically, we're looking at a rate of about, about two, million, 2 million a day, sort of in terms of chromium com production. Now, I'm trying desperately to think whether that's a million cubic feet or whatever it is a day, but yeah, sort of it's one of, these, one of these gas measures that I'm not particularly familiar with. Um, we have some in all the tests were were were, were successful uh, and successful enough that we've decided to move ahead with a um, three well uh, appraisal program across the uh, the, the one block and um, more likely than not we will drill a well in the in the neighboring block as well to test the extent of um, of this play so um, it is unconventional in nature so it's really a play you're testing rather than uh, rather than a uh, prospect um, but only time will show and hopefully these three appraisal wells will be enough to tell us whether we have uh, a commercial um, commercial project or not one of the big advantages of um, of this uh, this position here is that um, there is inf gas infrastructure already in place uh, gas being produced from shallow stratigraphy in the Thrace Basin. Uh, and of course, Turkey has, uh, has a, a very, very significant um, uh, gas market, um, albeit 98% of the gas which uh, Turkey consumes is being imported. And yes, we do have 3D seismic covering the, uh, the, uh, the license already. All right. Um, all right, uh, we have another question from uh, Peter again. I'm going to move Peter up where he can speak. And I'm going to unmute him. All right. Um, following on from that point, um, it, it raises an interesting question. Um, are uh, companies like Statoil suited to the unconventional play? Um, what my observation from say the US is uh, is you've got unconventional specialists or you've got your kind of marine deep water specialists and there's almost two different cultures competing against each other if the single company tries to do both so how does how for example does Statoil prioritize an unconventional play or weigh up an unconventional well against one of these North Sea, North sea wells that we're looking at? Okay. Um, 
Uh, great question. Simple answer is um, not easily. Uh, uh, as you say, there are uh, there are a lot of differences. Simply put, one of the major differences that you know, sort of one one expiration well in an unconventional play is is, is by no means you know sufficient you know, so to to know what you have. Um, to, to, you know whether you have a sort of a commerciality and you can always argue that for most conventional offshore fields well you need some appraisal as well basically on the unconventional side you need a lot more appraisal and then it becomes you know very much about the producibility of the uh, producibility of the of the of the hydrocarbons and you can say well producibility you know, is a major determining factor offshore as well how much production you can you, you can get per well I would argue that when it comes to the technical aspects, uh, I don't think that makes an awful lot of difference to a company like this. You know, sort of, um, we've been used to drilling horizontal wells for many, many years uh, offshore. Uh, so I don't see that as the biggest challenge. I think one of the biggest challenges here is, um, are the above ground ones and also related to the logistics, related to the operations. You know, actually having the right services, you know, sort of, Having the the right supply of goods, um, uh, supply of uh, of water and uh, propent, you know, for, for for fracking. When it comes to when it comes to the international opportunities versus the U.S. onshore opportunities, there's one really important difference, and that's scale. So if you go back to my exploration strategy, you know, sort of when we're picking up um, licenses and we've just signed off uh, on our first license in in the Vaca Muerte in Argentina as well, is that um, unlike the US, uh, you, can, you can pick up, you know, sort of contiguous acreage uh, covering hundreds of square kilometers where whilst the leases in the US are roughly five square kilometers with severe limitations, keep to drill commitments, et cetera, et cetera. So you can actually design a much, a much more sensible kind of technical program around unconventional opportunities internationally uh, and that applies both for Turkey uh, for Argentina and for what we're doing in uh, in Russia together with uh, with Rosneft um, so you know we have built up quite a lot of experience in the uh, in, in US onshore um, you know we're on this journey from you know, reducing the break-even from uh, around about 93 years ago down to close to 50 50 now um, not without its challenges uh, so that I think the other aspect here is that the way the US onshore industry have been run is kind of something for everyone and not least you know, so for the minor and smaller actors who are to be quite honest many of them uh, just looking to increase the value of their acreage and then before moving along a lot of them private equity uh, equity based and then finally, what I'd like to say about this is that, you know, given the conventional exploration results over the last few years, you can even take that back, you know, sort of a couple of decades, if you like. Um, it would seem to me at least, and I think probably most of my peers would agree, is that the likes of ourselves don't really have a choice. You know, sort of if we want to, uh, if, we, if we have a plan uh, to sustain our production, let alone grow it, then I think um, to a greater extent, you know, sort of more of that production will have to come from onshore positions and more likely uh, unconventional onshore positions like, like the one I talk about in Turkey and like the Vacamata in, uh, in, uh, in Argentina. Okay, thank you. Great insight. All right. Uh does anybody else have a, a question for Tim? I have one question. Uh, this is Adriana Ramirez. Um, what would Tim Dotson say to young geophysicists, especially to students who are maybe in these days, especially because of the downturn, the long downturn, considering whether or not they would study geophysics and they would follow a career in the energy industry? Great and uh, difficult, uh, difficult <laughs> question. Um, you know, I think from a from purely from an exploration point of view, 
I think this is, uh, I think this is uh, yeah, quite, a, quite a difficult question to ask. But if I broaden that, and I think about the oil and gas opportunity set at large, uh, and, and then convey the fundamental belief that I have and that Statoil has, and I know many of our peers, that, that oil and gas will be a really important part of the energy mix, as, you know, almost as far as we can see. If you believe in that, then there'll be a role for geophysicists in 20 years and 30 years and 40 years. Maybe not so much in the exploration sphere, but more in what I call the exploitation sphere. You know, sort of, and you see the industry moving more and more to, towards that, back towards the prolific basins, trying to get more out of existing reservoirs. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see a kind of a ramp up, you know, in, uh, in 40 seismic, you know, so there are people looking to extend the lifetime of their, 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 their existing fields. You know, maybe to extend that you know, sort of to the near fields area so that you can pick up small pockets which can be tied back now through you know, subsea templates or even you know, sort of uh, remotely operated unmanned platforms. I think these are all opening up you know, some new opportunity sets. And then I think we shouldn't forget you know, the, the onshore place. You know, sort of, um, there may not be many at the moment, but there are a number of, uh, of onshore basins um, I've mentioned two already, the vacuum white is fairly extensive where I think, and the US onshore to be quite honest, where I think uh, more sophisticated seismic and geophysical techniques will have a more important role to play you know, going forward. I think about the US onshore business as you know, having gone through two important phases, potentially entering into a third phase. The first phase is really about, you know, sort of, uh, sort of fundamental technology, you know, combination of, of uh, horizontal drilling and, and fracking techniques. The second one is really about manufacturing, it's just improving the efficiency, getting those wells, you know, making them longer, you know, doing them cheaper, you know, sort of, um, not, let alone safer. And then I think we're transitioning now to a new technology phase, but it's more micro technology, I think is going to be focused you know, much more on the details of the unconventional reservoirs. And some of those will be particularly important as you move to um, uh, a new phase, which is not necessarily drilling your original wells, but drilling infill wells and maybe refracking, you know, sort of existing, uh, existing, um, existing um, producers. So, and then I like, and I think I like to think about, you know, sort of over and beyond, over and beyond, you know, sort of the oil and gas industry. I wouldn't be surprised at all if you know, sort of we see new roles for geophysicists going forward. You know, you know, for us to be able to exploit not just the oil and gas resources, but other resources in 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 uh, in, in in the sub in in the subsurface, without me being able to point to any of those specifically. I think uh, I think uh, underground water resources. Yes, will become increasingly important you know, sort of going forward and like, more likely than not, then I think seismic will have an important role to play in that as well. Thank you. All right. Uh, anyone else have any questions for Tim? If you do, you can just uh, raise your hand. All right. Well, I don't see any additional questions. Adriana, would you like uh, any last words? No, I would just like to, to thank everyone who connected today and to thank Tim for his time and his very interesting presentation. Uh, just as an, an announcement, uh, our next presenter in May 22nd is going to be Maurice Nassim, president of Western Geco. And we are, we are planning other very interesting presentations as well. This one in particular is going to, it's, it has been recorded and it's going to be in the website, in our website. We will announce this in, in the paper. Thank you. Yep. Well, thank you, Tim. Uh, thank you, Adriana. And thank you everyone who has uh, attended. I uh, hope you uh, found some uh, interesting information. I know I did. And I look forward to uh, interacting with you all.
uh, in a little bit. Have Thank, a nice you. Day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.